by plane on a cloudy day. You drive to the airport and you're kind of watching the clouds up there and they're, they're kind of menacing and you're thinking, I don't even know if the plane's going to take off on time. And there's a kind of an anxiety that builds in your stomach. And yet, you got to go where you got to go. So you check in, you store your luggage, you board the plane. You might even obey the rules and turn your electronic gadgets off and take a deep breath and close your eyes and listen to the calm voice of the steward or stewardess as they prepare all the people for the flight. And then the plane taxis into position and begins to accelerate and you're pressed back into your seat and your neighborhood begins to fade first to a doll size and then to like a little Google map framed in your plane window. Suddenly the whole view is blocked by white nothingness as you enter into the clouds. There's no up and no down. They seem to completely lack substance and yet you can't see through them either. Life feels kind of ambiguous, suspended for a moment. I always hold my breath right then and hope that the pilot knows what they're doing and that they have enough electronic gadgetry in the cockpit to guide us through where we can't see. It can be a frightening experience. But suddenly that plane will burst free right into that glorious sunshine and light will fill the cabin and you'll feel the warmth of the sun on your cheek. You squint against the astonishing brightness of the moment and joy fills your heart. Freedom, exhilaration, peace. From this new perspective above the clouds, the journey is filled with radiance and hope. Soaring above the clouds, bathed in sunlight, don't you feel so much closer to God? Could it have been like that for the disciples on the mountain with Jesus? Peter, James, and John dutifully followed Christ step by step up the mountain to pray as they had done so many times before. They were tired. They were weighed down by sleeping. But they pressed on, taking their cues from their calm leader. As they prayed together with Jesus, they saw his face change. And then suddenly they noticed that two others had joined them, Elijah and Moses. They were talking about Jesus' final journey to Jerusalem. The moment was so unique so exhilarating that Peter wanted to hold on to it. He wanted to capture it by building monuments. And before he could even finish voicing this thought, a radiant cloud descended upon them all, and they felt lost in a moment of ambiguity. No up, no down. No substance, and yet they can't see. They were afraid until that voice of clarity burst through the clouds. This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. They descended that mountain with a new perspective a deeper understanding of who Jesus was. They had experienced a powerful, mind-blowing encounter with the glory of God, and they were changed. Now, some people are going to question, did they really see Moses and Elijah up there? And how, how did they know it was Moses and Elijah? You know, even though God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, they were inscribed on a tablet of stone. It was not Moses' face that was inscribed there. And even though 
Elijah represents all the prophets and the message from God, it's not like his face was imprinted on a coin. So how did they know it was Elijah and Moses, these people from history? What was that cloud all about? Is that a regular weather pattern for Mount Hebron? Or is that some exaggeration going on in the story? The story is told by three of the four Gospels, so we know that something important happened up there, something so important that the community tends to tell about it over and over again. Marcus Borg, an American New Testament scholar teaching about the use of metaphor says, our efforts are better spent at looking how people who remembered the story use it to teach others about religious and spiritual truths than arguing over the facts of how it happened. When we teach about spiritual truth using stories, it's not that the story isn't factual. It's at that moment, it's not the facts that are important. It's about what it's teaching. So what is the point of this transfiguration story? What is the metaphorical truth contained in behind what really happened? What does it tell us about God, ourselves, and our faith? First, that peak experiences in our lives do happen. We can't predict when. We can't create them. They come in God's time. They're powerful and they change us. Early in 2010, I went on a cross-cultural exchange trip to Santa Fe as part of my seminary studies. A small group of us went for a half-day hike up to one of the pinnacles on the Meza. The journey was arduous and sometimes even treacherous. We spoke little other than to encourage one another. And each of us had a different outcome from that trip. The young men just had fun and felt truly victorious. But Kathy, who was very, very afraid of heights, said she felt a close presence of God guiding her along those very steep trails. For me, I had a mountaintop epiphany. I had been struggling with my health for the previous two years. And even though I was continuing with seminary, I, I really had begun to doubt my calling. How was I going to lead a church when I barely had strength to get to a class? But on that day, after climbing up that mountain and standing in the sunshine on the top, top I knew that I would be strong enough. I knew that I had been restored. I knew that because God had called me that God would equip me for ministry. My life changed because I listened to that voice of clarity and followed. In our small groups this week, we've been sharing stories about how each of us has encountered that powerful moment of God. Um, Linda was going to share, but she's had dental surgery and she's not able to share right now. Is there anybody else who'd like to share a powerful moment that then? Um, <clears throat> I had, uh, well, I have a lot of things going on with my health, but one thing that I had was second stage kidney failure. And Pastor Wendy anointed me with oil. <clears throat> and about a month later, I went back and had my blood work taken from my kidney doctor, and my results were, it's gone. We can't box God up. You know, we're so used to having all the answers at our fingertips, particularly in this computer age. That, but our relationship with God is less like clicking through a bunch of Google search answers and more like entering a cloud where our vision is obscured 
and there is no up and down, and we don't know which is substance and which is which we should be able to see through until that voice brings us clarity. Peter, James, and John were changed on the mountain because not because they learned a lot of fun-filled facts, but because they had experienced Jesus' pure spirit. A moment like this is on such a grand scale. There's so much ecstasy that any attempt to control it is simply futile. We're compelled to yield to the God force that fills that moment, a force so powerful that it can change your life forever. Second thing that we can learn from this story is that what goes up eventually has to come down. We don't live on the top of the mountain. We can't build booths to freeze frame that spiritual high. When the disciples and Jesus returned to the base of the mountain, they went right back into ministry. Someone asked them to heal a boy that was having seizures, and Jesus did. This week I've been really aware of that contrast between light and dark and mountain and valley. And so when I took Melvin into the hospital this week, when we traveled through the inner city, wasn't it like the buildings were coming up and they were blocking out the sun? The buildings were so tall, it was so early in the morning, and it felt very va valley-like until I prayed with you right before I left you. And at that moment, I felt the presence of God. And this week, when I traveled through the tunnels over to the other side of Baltimore, I learned I did not like tunnels. <laughs> I went to see Peggy. And to me, that tunnel time felt very valley. But when I got to her hospital room, I was amazed at the care that she was receiving. And I was glad for the support of her husband and her son. And I took those as visible signs of God's grace in that moment. We spend most of our time in the ordinary valleys rather than the luminescent mountain tops. But God is with us there too. Our mountain top experiences change us and prepare us to find the mystery of the valleys, the mystery of God in our valleys. They empower us to find new ways of healing, like sharing cards with soldiers that are deployed, or ministering to families after they've had a house fire, or walking to solve the world hunger, or even gathering together on a Tuesday to eat pancakes so that we can save a family from medical debt. Therefore, as we begin this period of Lent, we don't have to enter the season dragging our feet and moaning around about the things that we're going to have to give up for 40 days or challenges that seem too big for us to tackle. Just as we know that when we're beneath the clouds and it's gloomy, that the sun is still shining, we also know that even if there's a moment when we're not sure of God's presence, that God is truly still there. And that means that we can enter Lent. We can launch into Lent, graced and knowing that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are somehow going to blow our minds and ignite our hearts as we seek to follow Jesus from the mountains to the base and through the valleys all the way into life eternal. Amen.